For those of you just tuning in, welcome back to APAX Tech Summit. I'm Madeline Milka, President and CEO of APAX. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our next speaker, KPAC Senate Associate Member, Senator Jackie Rosen. Senator Rosen was first elected to the U.S. Senate in 2018 and is the second woman to serve Nevada in the U.S. Senate. Prior to her career in politics, Senator Rosen was a computer programmer and remains the only former computer programmer in the U.S. Senate. As a result of her work as a computer programmer, the Senator has been a champion for strengthening our nation's cybersecurity and improving science, technology, engineering, and math STEM education. The Senator is also the co-founder and co-chair of the first ever Bipartisan Women in STEM Caucus in the Senate. She sits on the Senate Committee on Armed Services, the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, and the Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. She serves as the chair of the Subcommittee on Tourism, Trade, and Export Promotion. Let's give a warm welcome to Senator Jackie Rosen. Hello, I'm Jackie Rosen, and I'm honored to represent the great state of Nevada in the United States Senate. First, I'd like to thank Madeline Mielke for introducing me and for your work to advance the interests of the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community. I'm glad to be speaking with you all today about such an important topic. As a former computer programmer, I understand the importance of ensuring federal policies that they're responsive to the ever-changing technology world, such as artificial intelligence and what impacts it could have. In the Senate, I've led the charge to utilize artificial intelligence to strengthen our national security and ensure we don't fall behind other nations. That's why I introduced the Bipartisan Advancing American AI Innovation Act to enhance the collaboration between the Defense Department and the private sector when it comes to artificial intelligence to make sure our military always has cutting edge technology available. And as artificial intelligence becomes more widely used in all sectors, Congress can and must do more to support workers in this rapidly changing landscape. That's why I've introduced and supported legislation to strengthen workforce training and development programs and utilize returnships for those entering the workforce for the first time or looking to make a career change. Far too often, Washington is slow to catch up on innovations and create policies that help promote new technologies in a responsible way. I'll work with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to equip workers with the tools necessary to succeed in the jobs being created by this emerging technology. And that's why it's important now, more than ever before, we encourage people of diverse backgrounds to continuing to enter the field of STEM. It's why I co-founded the Senate's first ever Bipartisan Women in STEM Caucus to diversify the STEM field and bring more women and women of color into tech jobs. Earlier this year, I led the push to designate March 24th as National Women of Color in Tech Day and urged the Senate to help eliminate barriers for women of color looking to enter the technology industry. I know our future will be bright if we continue this effort, and I'm so grateful for the work that APAX is doing to support the AANHPI community. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today and enjoy the rest of the summit. It's my honor to introduce KPAC Executive Board Member, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Congresswoman Lee has proudly been representing California's 12th congressional district since 1998. She's the highest ranking African-American woman appointed to Democratic leadership, serving as co-chair of the Policy and Steering Committee. She also serves on the Budget Committee and the Appropriations Committee, which oversees all federal government spending. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Barbara Lee, proudly representing California's beautiful 12th Congressional District in the East Bay of Northern California. Thank you to Madeline Milka and the APAX board and team for inviting me to participate in the 2023 APAX Tech Summit. I would also like to thank KPAC Chair, a great woman warrior, Congresswoman Judy Chu and her staff for her tremendous leadership and her staff's tremendous hard work. 
As co-chair of the Congressional Black Caucus CBC Tech 2025 and co-chair of the Health Task Force of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, I have fought to improve diversity in the tech industry, which is so important as we think about the development and profile of AI. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the panel entitled Preparing the Digital Workforce. We all recognize the growth of artificial intelligence and other technologies and its impact on today's workforce. AI is rapidly changing systemic operations, good and bad, as we've seen in the Hollywood writer's strike to, yes, saving lives with more accurate medical diagnosis. We must also adapt our policies and oversight on AI bias to prevent harms within the growing field. That is why I reintroduced the Computer Science for All Act, H.R. 4174, with Congressman Chuck Fleischman. This bipartisan legislation provides $250 million in new grants to support a diverse tech pipeline in pre-K through 12th grade education. We must invest in preparing our young people for the STEM jobs of the future by providing training and learning opportunities, especially in low-income and underserved communities. It is critical that we build a diverse pipeline of talent to address emerging needs, such as professionals engaged in dismantling and preventing AI bias. This panel will discuss policies and initiatives that can ensure individuals and communities of color are equipped to thrive in the changing job market. Also, I know many of you are involved with the development and implementation of the Health Equity and Accountability Act. For over 20 years, HIA has served as the platform to bring together stakeholders invested in addressing the underlying challenges that prevent underserved communities from accessing quality health care. HIA includes a provision that would require the establishment of a task force on preventing AI and algorithmic bias in healthcare. The task force would provide practical and ethical guidance on the integration of AI and algorithm rhythms in the healthcare service delivery process. To enact systemic changes that reflect the needs of all of our communities we need your continued involvement, advocacy, and support. I look forward to continuing this effort with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your remarks. Our next panel is on preparing the digital workforce. Artificial intelligence, or AI, and other technologies are transforming the skills required by today's workforce. AI is increasingly integrated into various sectors, rapidly reshaping the landscape of industries and the nature of work, from center stage and the Hollywood writer strike to saving lives with more accurate medical diagnoses. This panel will discuss policies and initiatives that can ensure individuals and communities of color in particular are equipped to thrive in the changing job market. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this panel, Brian Jung, who is a business and data reporter for NBC News. He covers all things related to the economy and finance across NBC's broadcasts, including the Today Show, NBC Nightly News, MSNBC, and digital platforms, NBCNews.com, and NBC News Now. Brian began his career as an analyst at the Federal Reserve before transitioning to journalism as a beat reporter in DC. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Brian and our next group of panelists. Hi there, how's it going? My name is Brian Chung. I'm a business and data reporter with NBC News. Really pleased to welcome you uh, to this panel about artificial intelligence and the workforce. There's a lot of transformation happening in many sectors from Hollywood to uh, medicine to even newsrooms when it comes to artificial intelligence. We wanna ask the question, how is it going to impact the way that we work? Who those workers are, communities of color particularly. So we have a really all-star uh, panel compiled today to help address some of those questions, and I'll introduce them uh, quickly, and then I'll have each of them kind of uh, say and, and explain a little bit more about what they do. Uh, so we have Tali Bray, an Executive Vice President of Technology, Diversity, Community, and Sustainability at Wells Fargo. 
Shreya Singh Hernandez, a tech equity research manager and tech accountability coalition uh, with the Aspen Digital As at the Aspen Institute. We have Sina Weepy, who is the policy associate uh, for empowering Pacific Islander communities, as well as Kanbu, who is the CEO and executive director of the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers. Uh, thank you all so much for taking the time to chat uh, with us. And it's going to be a really great conversation, but I, I kind of want to just start off by having uh, each of you introduce yourself and the work that you do on this topic. And let's go, how about in the order that I introduced them in. Uh, so let's have Tali begin by sharing a little bit about yourself. Hey, Brian, thank you so much. And I'm thrilled to be here with this uh, uh, esteemed panel today talking about really one of, I think, the most pressing topics impacting many communities. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm the head of technology, diversity, community and sustainability. And I would say what that really fundamentally means is I lead the organization that is driving people strategy for the technology org at Wells Fargo, roughly 40,000 people uh, across the globe. And when we think about people strategy, um, one of the key things we always look at is ensuring that our workforce reflects the communities that we serve. Um, there is a ton of data that demonstrates diverse organizations outperform on just about every single KPI there is. And as we start to talk about things like AI, um, and I you know, will note that AI itself is not new, but this sort of generative AI is really accelerating some of the shift we see in the workforce. But as we talk about those functions, um, the idea of representation takes on, I think, an even more pressing sense of urgency. So when we think about those you know, large language models, right, the big data sets that people are working with, it's critical that we have individuals that reflect a variety of lived experiences at the table that are talking about governance, that are talking about alignment techniques, um, that are talking about verification techniques, value learning. Um, so where we really think the opportunity is right now is to look at core DEI principles around representation, inclusion, and applying those to this really rapidly accelerating emerging field uh, around sort of that leapfrog in AI. You know, the other thing that I would just state is that when we look at when we look at the importance of this field and the impact to a lack of representation. So in those data sets, for example, we know right now that communities of color, communities that are not speaking English are, you know, woefully underrepresented in the large language models, which impacts outcomes. How do we start to think about representation, not only in the people um, designing models, you know, working on alignment techniques, but also that underlying data? How do we ensure that we get more representation? Because this is going to, as you mentioned, touch every aspect of our lives going forward. Um, so I'll, I'll pause with that. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tali. And, and it's such an honor to be here with you and the rest of our panelists today. My name is Shreya Singh Hernandez. I use she, her pronouns. I have a background in data-driven social impact, including API community organizing at both a local to a national scale. Um, currently, I am at Aspen Digital, a policy program of the Aspen Institute on a small team at the Tech Accountability Coalition focusing on civil rights, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tech sector from people operations all the way to pro product impact. Um, in this work, I am privileged to be able to work alongside just about 200 plus tech experts and leaders in community spaces looking at tech equity across 30 of the largest tech companies um, that you can imagine. Um, in my role, I get to interact on a daily basis with folks working in product equity. So how do we ensure that the tech products that are produced are serving people, are serving communities, are reflective of the challenges and opportunities that we have um, across the diversity of our experiences? Um, I get to work with data justice, uh, something that is very near and dear to my heart, especially as it intersects with the API community and the diversity that we hold within, um, you know, this this patchwork uh, of a community that we have, and AI fairness, uh, in addition to inclusive product design. I'm really excited about this conversation, especially at this given moment, with the amount of uh, potential that we have in this space and the timeliness of this conversation. So thank you to the team at Apex for the introduction. 
Hello, everyone. Maloy um, Lele. My name is Sina Weepi. My pronouns are she and her. And I am the DC based policy associate for Empowering Pacific Islander Communities, also known as EPIC. Uh, we work alongside partners such as APEX and the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, um, also known as NCAPA. Um, and NCAPA is also based in Washington, D.C. I'm currently zooming in from the ancestral lands of the Tongva people um, in Los Angeles. Uh, we are a pro-Black, pro-Indigenous, and anti-racist national organization based in Los Angeles, working to advance social justice for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities on the continental U.S. Through culture-centered advocacy, leadership development, research, and narrative change. Every issue is a Pacific Islander issue, including what and how AI will impact the workforce and how it's already doing that as well. All of the issues, um, data, data disaggregation and language access are two key themes that cut across all the issues we work on and is something we continue to advocate for at the local, state, and federal level. With AI, it's not an issue that we're included on in terms of discussion and decision-making. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to be amongst fellow colleagues who work more closely on AI and identify ways of how we can work together. We just acknowledged um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Equal Pay Day, which was on August 30th. So we're, so we're curious how this will impact NHPI women in particular. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Khan Vu, CEO and CEO, Executive Director for the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers. I'm delighted to be with you today. This is such a hot topic. It has huge ramifications for our community and the community at large. Uh, the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers, uh, shortly known as SACE, uh, is one of the largest API organizations in the United States. We have over 90 chapters across uh, different colleges, and we work with over 100 uh, Asian ERGs, employee resource groups uh, in corporate America. And we're hosting one of the largest career fairs and conference uh, with over 3,000 people in the next five weeks in Atlanta. How we intersect and how we think about AI is many of our members uh, are going to be programmed using AI and how it affects the work that they do. So I look forward to the discussion and uh, yeah, I'm excited for this topic because as uh, you know, as others have said, this is germane to what people are thinking and we need to make sure it is inclusive uh, right at the onset. Thanks so much, everyone. And uh, what a great way to just kind of show the range of different perspectives that we're going to have as part of this conversation. Um, I want to talk about just first at a very basic level, how is artificial intelligence going to impact uh, the workforce? And I'll go to Khan for, for this first, because I feel like you have a kind of good um, view of, of specific applications that are happening in 2023, because a lot of this can be very theoretical. What are some of the ways in which you're seeing specific types of industries being transformed uh, by AI? Thanks, Brian. I mean, the name out there right now is Chat GPT, right? It's impacting all of our work. I mean it'd be rare to find someone who hasn't heard of it because it's, you know, to reach 100 million users, it did it within days versus, you know, some of the other technologies. So it is very profound and everybody can have access to it. So just from um, kind of an industry sound, it's impacting all industries, uh, but it just doesn't stop there. I mean, companies are using ChatGPT, large language models, and other AI tools to really become more efficient, um, become more, uh, let's say, productive. Uh, there was a study by The Lancet, and they were looking at AI. This is one of the largest medical studies uh, on mammography, and they talked to the radiologists. What they found out was a couple things. A, <clears throat> the radiologists were afraid of AI going into it. But the AI helped identify 20% more of the, the cancers that would not have been detected. And the radiologists at the end were becoming 44% more efficient. 
So I think there's a lot of impact across the industries uh, to your question, right? <clears throat> it's our imaginations really at the end of the day, that's kind of limiting what it is because people are using it in so many different ways that we can't spend our whole time talking about the different areas that are gonna impact. Uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, currently there is a strike in Las uh, Vegas right now. Thousands of people are showing up striking. Uh, the Culinary uh, Workers Union is striking because they're afraid of AI taking their jobs. And they already are having bartenders who are not bartenders, but robots serving drinks. And so they want to make sure that they are trained and they have time to train and that they make sure that uh, they have the breath to, as we, we discussed, you know, reskilling folks so that they continue to provide value. I know some of our other panelists have really strong and uh, thoughts on this too. Yeah, no, I mean, even in, in our industry in news, uh, you know, there's been talk of some other newsrooms using AI to, to generate written stories. I've tried to feed us feed a story through AI. It didn't come out that great, so I think it's still got some got some work. I'll still be employed at least for the time being. Um, I want to go to. Uh, uh, Tali next, because I think that, um, Khan, you, you outlaid, you know, a very nice amount of uh, uh, examples there. But, you know, Tali, you're, you're at a company, you're at Wells Fargo in the financial services world. This could be hugely transformative as, as well. How is your bank thinking about um, AI and, and how are you kind of helping to implement that? So, you know, I'd say a couple of things. Um, one, I, I want to restate, AI is not new. So companies have been leveraging AI for 10 years. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, I was working in contact center technologies as we were looking at bringing together self-service channels like digital channels with assisted service with contact centers. And we were looking at understanding employee sentiment. And we were looking at how we wanted to route calls based on information. This was all artificial intelligence, whether it was natural language processing, machine learning, We've had fraud models for many, many years, machine learning. So AI itself is not new. I think what is new and how we're looking at this in two ways is the volume of data and the, like the volume of data, the representation of data, the speed with which we can now ask questions, propose hypotheses and get an answer and how that's really going to shift how people work. So I think about, um, we are looking at, for example, can we now more effectively understand what our diverse segments may be not only looking for from a product perspective, but how they're feeling about us from a sentiment perspective? And so we're looking at AI techniques to aggregate existing data populations that we may have. We may have data sets around you know, customer behavior. We may have data sets around employee sentiment. We may have data sets around um, just public sentiment from social. How do we now aggregate those and think about specific questions or hypotheses that allow us to better understand our diverse segments and think about supporting and serving them from a product development perspective in a different way? Um, you know, as we look at um, fraud, as we look at decisioning, we also are incredibly aware of the fact that there is bias in data because many of these models are based on historical data and decisions. So we know that bias is inherent in that. This comes back to the comment around representation. If we do not have people at the table working on models, thinking about alignment techniques, which is really how do you ensure that the AI is aligned to your value proposition, to your goals? How do you get value learning out of this? If we don't have people that reflect a variety of lived service, uh, lived experiences at the table in those roles, we perpetuate that bias. So I think the thing that's really um, important to understand is we have an opportunity to uh, amplify and accelerate bias sort of in a non-linear function. We also have an opportunity at a systemic level to potentially start to address some of that historical bias and decision making by looking at that data and having individuals um, verify and ensure that we're addressing some of the historical inputs in the system and shifting decision making coming out of that. So, you know, I'd say we're continuing to do what we've done. There's not, we are not using Gen AI, for example, to write marketing materials or to develop new product concepts. You know, we are doing what we've done, but we're now like, I think very thoughtful and intentional in ensuring that we're recognizing we have an opportunity and a responsibility to address bias in the historical data that allows us to sort of move forward, I think, in a more equitable way. 
Yeah, and that's a really good humbling reminder too that uh, ChatGPT uh, is not the start of AI. The AI has been around for a while, but it was only until November when people could start signing up for the beta that everyone seems to think that AI started. Um, I want to kind of uh, pass the ball over to Shreya because, you know, again, we're talking about applications of this in, in, in the corporate world, and you have the unique perspective of working with a lot of companies, not just national, but global as well, as they try to develop and apply AI as well. You know, Tali mentions bias. What, in what ways are you seeing companies kind of thinking about that as they as they try to um, get through the iterative process of implementing this? Yeah, absolutely. And and to go back to the conversation, and um, you know, we've seen IBM put out a survey or a study um, very recently that shows that executives estimate that about forty percent of their workforce will need to reskill as a result of implementing AI and automation over the next three years. And this was a survey of 3,000 global C-suite leaders across 28 different countries. So this is definitely a global workforce issue. It's an issue that we see leaders and managers um, and you know, individual contributors grappling with on a day-to-day -day basis and getting an understanding of how AI and the implementation of, of these tools in their day-to-day -day will affect their jobs and how to reskill. I, I want to be careful about not using the word upskill. Um, all labor is skilled labor. There is no unskilled labor. So using the word reskill, how do we make sure that folks are keeping up with um, the new tools that are emerging and, and making sure that their um, careers are, are adapting and that the um, workforce environment is adapting to ensure that it is serving everywhere, that it's a, that it's a safe environment for folks. Um, LinkedIn also recently saw a 21% increase in the share of English language job postings that mentioned new AI technologies such as uh, ChatGPT since November 2022 in their latest report. In June 2023, very recently, the number of AI skilled members on LinkedIn was nine times larger than it was in 2016. So we're definitely seeing both an increase in uh, demand for these jobs and skills, as well as an increase in an appetite for workers to reskill themselves with more of um, the sorts of skill sets that an AI integrated workspace would require. Um, lastly, I want to step back and think about the pathways into technology, the pathways into employment, which is another part of the work that uh, my team touches, and a reframing of um, you know young folks or folks coming in come to the job environment, thinking about um, what is the problem that they want to solve rather than the role or title that they would like to have. We're seeing such a rapid shift in the way that job, job architecture is set up, in the way that roles are set up with the increased involvement of technology and a reframing of how folks are um, reskilling or, or you know, um, educating themselves on these new technologies is incredibly impactful, especially in this moment of, of rapid change uh, in the job environment. Um, I want to talk about the people that um, are going to be at the core of this AI development and also displacement as well, because I think, again, the, the point of this conversation is to talk about the impact on the workforce. And I want to go to Sina for a very important question about marginalized groups that have often been overlooked by human beings, but could also be at risk of being overlooked by uh, the data and also by the, the underlying technology underpinning AI as well. Um, how are you kind of thinking about that and, and, and what can we do to make sure that uh, groups like um, Pacific Islanders aren't uh, forgotten as part of this process? Thanks, Brian. Um, so going back to my point earlier, um, I had mentioned I just want to hone in a little bit on what um, the wage gap has looked like for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander women. Um, for every dollar earned by white non-Hispanic men working full-time year-round uh, based uh, in 2021, NHPI women working full-time year-round only earned 65 cents. The biggest wage gaps experienced by NHPI women are hidden in data that lumps Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander people together. 
this goes back to my point earlier about data disaggregation and why it's so important for our communities. In terms of the pandemic, which was a huge impact on many communities, including NHPI communities, um, it pushed out women out of the workforce and made it challenging to collect data on this. We've worked closely with the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, uh, NAPOF, and they found that this has been especially true for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander women who faced unique challenges during the pandemic. The lack of employment benefits in frontline and low-wage jobs already prevent many Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander women from accessing things such as healthcare. So I think even before we talk about uh, AI, particularly for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, we really need to understand um, what we're currently facing, what we have been facing, and really appreciate Tali's point about AI has been around. And I'm positive that many of these impacts that I've just shared with you were also um, impacted by AI as well. I think what I've been very curious to learn more about um, and definitely welcome um, more conversation on it is um, what the benefits could potentially be of AI and, and how this could impact our specific communities um, and then how data disaggregation will be addressed, how language access will be addressed as well. Um, so yeah. Thanks for that. And again, it's I mean it's just such an important part of the conversation, not just even for, you know, Pacific Islanders, but for many other types of communities that have been historically marginalized and overlooked. Um, I want to ask about how and, and kind of dive a little bit deeper into how our the way that we work is going to change. And, and Tali, I, I, I think that you have some some perspective on kind of how the roles that we're in are going to change. It, in, in some cases, yeah, it might displace the job entirely because a robot's going to be able to do it. But for most people, it's just going to change the way that we work. And that could also change the, the talent pipeline for who companies recruit, right? Right. Yeah. So I think a couple of um, comments have been made that I want to um, amplify. Uh, number one, when we think about displacement or we think about how the shift, um, how this shift in technology is going to change, how we work, how we need to reskill. I think the positive thing here is when we think about um, an AI driven economy and AI centric economy, we also have an opportunity to really open the talent aperture, particularly when we think about technology fields um, specifically. So when we look at tech roles, historically, we have looked at people with four year computer science degrees that have experience coding in specific languages. Um, we know immediately, right when you start there, you have like, put up barriers for significant populations, many of them from historically marginalized communities. So as we start to look at um, fields around AI that are going to come out, I mean, I think one of the things we're realizing is a four-year degree is not a requirement to be in these fields. Um, there is opportunity in terms of different types of roles, um, whether they're you know, experienced designers, integration specialists, if you think about a traditional engineering role and you think about something like um, Cobalt, which is a tool that basically can generate code. I now have the best coach sitting with me day by day, helping me improve my development and allowing me potentially to focus more on the experience that I'm looking to create rather than the underlying code that is developing that experience. And so when we look for um, the type of talent that we want to bring into the organization, we have an opportunity to look at non-traditional pipelines. So again, folks that may be coming um, out of, you know, um, out of school uh, without a four-year degree, um, folks that may be re-entering the workforce, uh, folks that may be, um, you know, re-entering uh, either because they've had a just you know some a life event that has taken them out, um, re-entering for for whatever reason, we now have an opportunity to say uh, look at a variety of skills and think about how we can actually train people on the job. Because the other thing I would say is that the you know the shelf life of um, technology is decreasing rapidly, and so as we see 
technology accelerating, we also see the shelf life decreasing, like almost, you know, in this correlated way. So what we really want in terms of talent is people that are continuous learners, people who are curious, people who are analytical, people who are logical, not necessarily very specific requirements of a four year degree you know, in computer science or a PhD in data science. There will always be the need for very specialized roles, but there's also an opportunity, you know, as I said, for people to come in in analyst functions where you don't need to be, you know, um, gifted in linear algebra. There are people that can come in and focus on, you know, experience where you don't need to have a degree in design or marketing. Um, so we're really excited, I think, about the opportunity that this allows us to bring in talent from what we would call non-traditional pipelines and think about how we develop that talent internally um, and how we create sort of organizations that are continuously learning because this will continuously evolve. That in conjunction with, I think, the support that emerging AI tools can bring to individuals from a learning perspective will create a really interesting opportunity to reach out to communities that I think have really been um, historically excluded from access to these you know, quite lucrative roles, particularly within technology. So we also think you know, if we partner with organizations that are focused on um, you know, education, like uh, Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers, Ascend Leadership, and we talk about, okay, how do we think about reaching out and providing sort of basic fundamental skills and competencies that will allow us to bring people into the organization and potentially leapfrog, you know, some of the lack of access that has historically, you know, I, this, this word is maybe dramatic, but it's true that it's historically plagued certain communities, right? Like just a totally systemic lack of access. So I do think there's a way that we can leapfrog that but again, I'm going to emphasize like representation of all aspects of an organization is critical because the people making policy decisions within organization, whether it's HR, whether it's product, whether it's segment sales, really need to represent those communities to ensure that this um, focus and prioritization is there. Yeah, uh, as someone who likes to think of himself as gifted in linear algebra, I kind of take offense to that. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Um, I really agree with you, Pally. Uh, I think this is an opportunity in time where we can reimagine how we engage folks uh, from a talent side and how we look at work. The traditional gatekeepers, as you mentioned, the four years, the PhDs, the masters have been traditional gatekeepers. My concern along what you've said is that if we continue to do the same thing we do, we will get the same results. If we, if our gatekeepers, the HR people, are not aware that you don't need a four degree to to maybe do prompt engineering, but there are definitely specific skill sets that they need to be successful. And what are those skill sets? We really have to think about and really put some thought into what are the skills, not the labels or the titles or the fundamental like calculus, because calculus is a huge hurdle for many people, though. One of my bucket lists is to go back and teach calculus because that's one of my things. But really, really think about that to remove some of those unnecessary barriers, right? To make sure that we engage our full economy. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, senior could probably talk about a long time is these underrepresented Asian groups that have been excluded in some of those lucrative jobs, these lucrative opportunities because they don't have the prerequisites. They didn't go to the right school, get the right degrees. So I, I think it's a challenge on our lawmakers, on our HR folks, the traditional gatekeepers to really rethink what we need in this next new economy to, to engage the full economy. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Brian, or one of the, or no, Shreya, you wanna jump in here? Yeah, well, actually, I, I, I'll jump in first because I think that what we're getting at here is kind of just the the precautions that we need to take to make sure that we're not excluding people along along this process, which is going to be different depending on what industry you're talking about. Uh, the biases might be different in, in 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 one industry, one company than than the other. But you know, Shreya, I want to kind of ask you about uh, you know the ways in which okay, yeah, AI is going to make us more productive, but maybe that actually is going to be a bad thing because you're going to have people exploiting labor are, are there certain situations where you're seeing kind of like a lumping of of, of work and and you know how how can we make sure that we're addressing that as we kind of think about even the global scale of all of this 
Yeah, thank you so much, Brian. Um, I definitely love to scope out a bit into the global scale of the work and what it actually takes to create the models that we're looking at and are able to employ and speed up and expedite our work on a daily basis today that are really, you know, giving us so much privilege and, and access um, to immense speeds of work. Um, there's been amazing reporting coming out recently about the labor that's put in behind these models, behind um, you know, uh, what folks are calling crowd work. Uh, for example, Rebecca Tan and Regine Cabado out of uh, the Washington Post just um, put out an article talking about the 2 million plus people in the Philippines that perform crowd work, for an example. Um, and, you know, it, it's part of, as they call it, AI's vast underbelly of this global um, network of workers that often don't see the same amounts of profit from these tools as we do in, in the United States, or it's very concentrated in the tech sector and the leaders there. Um, you know, we they say AI is often thought of as a human-free machine learning system, and the technology is, is very abstract, but it actually requires an intensive amount of labor from people, and often those people exist in the global south and are subject to exploitation as as you know Rebecca Tan and, and Regine Cavado in this article that I just referenced um, talk about. Another great reporter is Billy, Billy Perigo, who um, has been putting out amazing work on um, the human capital, the labor that is um, so intensively mined, if you will, to create um, the labels and and the um, to comb through the data um, and make the models that we are able to access today. And um, you know, he reports that in an AI data sector, which is worth over two billion globally in 2022, and is projected to rise um, to 17 billion dollars by 2030, that very little of that money flows to the data workers in places like India, Kenya, and the Philippines. The other thing in the context of a global perspective here is also the language gap. Most of these models, most of these um, you know, pieces of technology use English as the lingua franca. And not only expand that um, you know, pay gap that I just talked about, that wage gap globally, but also expand this language gap, this language access gap, where um, you know, cutting edge AI in models like uh, in large language models like ChatGPT often rely on English as its primary or only language in both text and audio data. And other languages that may have you know millions of speakers are often getting um, uh, deprioritized and exponentially potentially deprioritized through these models. I'd love to highlight um, a person whose work I really admire, uh, Michael Running Wolf um, up in Canada. He's pursuing his um, PhD and has started um, Indigenous in AI and is working to keep um, uh, indigenous languages alive through the use of AI, through creating these, these data sets spoken by native speakers. But, you know, when we scope out globally, that's another um, two issues that I'd love to bring into this conversation. Yeah. And those are really great examples of kind of how those communities that want to make sure they have a seat at the table are inserting themselves into that conversation, which I think is a great way to bring Sina back into this conversation and just kind of ask, like, how are Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities kind of viewing their position at the AI table? Do you feel, and you kind of alluded to the fact that you feel like you you haven't been included historically in, in, in many conversations, how, how, are you, how can you make sure that you're part of that? And, and uh, are there examples that you've seen in the past of, like, you weren't included at first, then you got a seat at the table, and then you were able to advocate for yourselves? Yeah, thank you, Brian, for that question. Um, I think it's just really important to, to stick to what we are continuing to do with partners such as Apex, which are build relationships with uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community organizations, um, NHPI leaders, and especially young people. I'm really um, glad that Shreya point made that point. Um, and just really share the benefits um, what, of what AI can provide. Um, I, I know that I, with two conversations, right? One with our elders, one with our young people, those can look very different. Um, sometimes it can, um, 
it's a little tricky when it happens at the same time. Those conversations happen happen at the same time. But I feel like when we get conversations with uh, in smaller groups with our communities, with elders, with young people, we are able to hear more of their concerns. Um, and so I think bringing them into the conversation will definitely you will hear more concerns. Um, but I, I also know that they would be open to learning what the benefits are, um, how we can get more involved and be a, and be a part of important discussions and making decisions. And really, really appreciate uh, the point that Tali made about non-traditional pathways. Um, that is literally what our communities are, are rooted in for many NHPI uh, people. And just how reskilling and training um, that some of my colleagues here uh, spoke to earlier could look like for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. Thanks for that perspective. And, you know, I think that the <laughs> overarching, which I think is good for any emerging technology of this conversation has been kind of, you know, a sense of, of caution and a bit of concern as well. But, you know, Khan, I want to throw the question to you, like, what, what's the upside of this for marginalized communities as well, right? I mean, we talk about AI, everyone's like, this is going to be the biggest transformational thing that could be uh, up to the scale of the industrial revolution. What are the good aspects of that? I mean, I guess in many ways, the conversation of us even being included as part of that, you know, marginalized communities having a seat at the table is already maybe miles ahead of previous large technological innovations. Yeah, I think you raise a good point is, you know, yes, we need to be cautious, but what are the benefits? Bringing these marginalized groups to the table, decision making and in being inclusive, making sure that they are part of the communities that we lift up and become educated in this area and have the skills to take advantage of the AI economy. Those are kind of the, the, I think, some of the questions that we as a society need to ask is, are we willing to have them at the table and are we willing to invest in those communities to bring them along? Um, AI in itself is going to increase our productivity. I mean, we're going to be so competitive as the talk of, you know, the CEOs that now, Shreya has mentioned that how many CEOs, how many companies are talking about AI is just incredible. And they're implementing those technologies to become more productive. So that means they can do things better, faster. Uh, the Lancet article I re referred to earlier is, look, we're going to catch 20% more people who have cancer than we would have without. So we're probably possibly saving 20% more lives, right? So those are the positive impacts, but we've got to make sure that we bring people outside of the existing structures to be included in the, the table decision making and also inclusive as we transform our economy so yeah i think there's a lot of positive we just be mindful about how we get there together hopefully and i think that's a really good way to kind of launch into uh the final round of questions that i'll have here and uh i think we got five minutes left so let, let's try to be be uh, efficient here but what is the most impactful thing that we collectively need to do to get ahead of all of this. It's all happening so fast, but at, we want to talk about actionable things here. So Tali, let, let me begin with you and kind of get your thoughts on what's the thing that we need to do right now in 2023 to get Okay, so um, we can think about this and this, I'm not, this is not my phrase, so I am borrowing this phrase, but moving from atoms to bytes. So we are moving from a physical world to a digital world. And more and more of our experience will be in that digital world, whether it is access to financial services, whether it is access to personalized health, as Khan mentioned, you know, as Sina mentioned, whether it is access to educational and non-traditional pathways, it will be in a bite-centered environment, in a digital environment. I feel extremely passionately that governance, and, and, and this is going to be US-centric, so I will, I will be clear that this is sort of a, a US-centric view, but global access, I just said US centric and then said global. However, access for everyone as an inalienable right to internet is going to be required. If we do not start with that, game over, right? Like the most fundamental level, if I do not ensure that everyone has access, not just from an education, from a healthcare, from a financial services, from an opportunity perspective, but also social aspects will be more and more digital. It is essential that everyone have access. And I think that that's something that the government has to look at. 
right? We haven't talked about government role in this, and I know that could be an entirely separate conversation. But from a, you know, a governance perspective to ensure that there is fair and equitable access, that there is fair and equitable representation, that there are standard verification and testing um, expectations, that is for me, I think one of the most fundamental things we can do to ensure that we are not amplifying historic um, inequities and that we're taking this opportunity to address them. So I would start with universal access to the internet. Yeah, thank you so much, Tally, and, and definitely agree with you. To take that one step further, I think um, in this process of uh, massive and rapid change in the workforce and the skills required, I think everybody needs to be you know, some level of an expert or at least familiar on how AI intersects with their work and how it could intersect with their work. Um, I definitely think that being vigilant about the biases that exist in society, be, being very clear eyed and open about how historical biases present, Talia, as you've been mentioning a lot throughout this conversation, Khan, Sina, you as well. Um, how do those biases show up and you know being incredibly vigilant about how they're showing up in the data that you're seeing there's a massive amount of production of audio visual text everything that's going to come out and you know it is the responsibility of the the creators of these products but also all of us regardless of background to be able to really hone in on how these products are are increasing the bias in our society or repeating bias that already exists and you know for me it is um, making sure we are aware of the skills that we need to invest in um, structurally and individually and being aware of the bias that we might be repeating or that might be in the training sets of data yeah, uh, my ad would be 100% with Talib. I mean, if you don't have access, you don't have it. You need to have access. That's first and foremost. Secondly, uh, Treya, you know, I think the bigger picture, I would wrap that around is you'll hear a lot of this word of ethical AI, right? And the first principle of ethical AI is fairness and bias. We've got to make sure that folks are first sign off on ethical AI, and that's part of their directive. If they're, you're going to create products with AI, it needs to be ethical. And so the first principle you mentioned, Shreya, is fairness and bias. We must look for that. The second principle is trust and transparency. The third is accountability. Uh, the fourth is social benefit. You know, where are we going with this? And the fourth is privacy and security. So these principles will help guide us, but we need to make sure they're being adhered to. So that's the other thing is the oversight around these principles, especially with these for-profit companies, because their drivers are not ethical AI, it's for profit. So we have to make sure that we're aware of all these principles and follow them. The last thing I'll add uh, here is on a personal level, my son, my 16 year old son who loves to challenge me on a lot of things, came home one day and said, dad, would you defend me if I was accused of using chat GPT at school? And I was, I said to him, well, it depends. So I, I would say to him, well, it depends on how you use it. If you just use it to rip off and turn it in, then you didn't really use it as a learning tool. But if you use it as a learning tool, I will defend you day and night. So I think it's, a, it's, it's upon us how we teach the ethics of using these tools, because they, at the end of the day, they are tools. And if we are not conscious of how we use these tools, then it's on us for using it wrong. So I'll leave it with that. But uh, it's an interesting conversation, and we'll continue to have these conversations. Thanks, Khan. I know it's really, we can get really caught up in thinking about how this will impact just if we focus on the perspective at a very uh, US centric level, but as as a Pacific Islander organization, and, and I know that we do focus on um, serving our NHPI communities on the continental US, um, if we're talking about access, right, and making sure that everyone has access, we can't talk about that without thinking about the U.S. Uh, Pacific Island territories and those that have relationships with the U.S., um, especially when it comes to climate change. We've seen three natural disasters happen in the past year or so in the Pacific, um, most recently um, Lahaina in Maui. And how does AI impact 
right, uh, those natural disasters and those crises, um, and specifically families and communities that we continue to serve and help. Um, and secondly, while well, data disaggregation, we're always in continuing to uh, push for that as well. And lastly, um, continuing to be part of these conversations. Thank you. And uh, I just want to wrap up here because we are at time. It turns out time flies when you're uh, talking about something as uh, nuanced and complicated as AI, but a really fantastic, uh, wide-ranging conversation there. So first of all, I just want to thank uh, Khan, Shreya, Sina, and Tali for taking the time um, to have this conversation. And then, of course, I want to thank uh, Apex for uh, putting this really fantastic panel and all this programming uh, together. So um, again, a lot of things to chew on at the end there. And I think that uh, really... Khan, you, you said something that kind of spoke to me there. It's just that this is a tool and the way that we use it is going to be so important in how the future generation of people work as we've kind of outlined in, in the last um, almost hour. So thanks again for everyone for uh, your input and really looking forward to the future uh, conversations, which I'm sure we'll be having uh, as part of this. So thanks again, and I'll uh, pass it on back to you.